I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny. What's up? I have a problem with Lisa. She said that I hit her. <sighs> what? Well, did you? No, it's not true. Don't even ask. What's new with you? The Room is a film from 2003, written, directed, and starred in by the visionary Tommy Wiseau. It's a film beloved by many that's been endlessly dissected and analyzed online. It still regularly plays in independent theaters around the world, and the story of its making received a big budget Hollywood adaptation. So why? What makes this movie so special? Well, simply, it's one of the worst movies ever made, and it's one of the best unintentional comedies ever. So what do I mean by Riot doesn't appreciate the room? Riot doesn't want any bad content in League of Legends. Over the past few years, they've reworked more and more champions and items to make the game look better or be more competitive, but in the process, erase some of the heart and soul of the game. I think we can all think of songs, movies, books, and especially games that we know are bad but love anyway. Every medium is better off for having some terrible content. Bad movies can be absolutely hilarious to watch, but more importantly, analyzing them helps us understand what makes a good movie. So now imagine if a Hollywood director decided to remake The Room, but took it completely seriously. If you directly adapt the plot without all the strange dialogue, cheap sets, and terrible acting, it's just a melodrama about a guy who gets cheated on and then kills himself. Even if it was well made and turned out to be a solid b drama, would anyone care or watch it over the original? I don't think so. Now what if to force their remake to succeed, they tracked down every copy of the original and destroyed it? Would the movie industry be better off? With League being a competitive game, and all the champions having to interact with each other, it's not a perfect metaphor, obviously. Riot definitely has some need to make changes for the sake of balance, but if we look at the reworks, almost all save for Rise, were not of champions that were considered broken or even strong. They were mainly champions that were considered super weak, with really small pick rates. Now these champions were weak for a reason. Most had gameplay that was unhealthy. If their numbers were buffed too high, there was just nothing you could do about them. No counterplay. Take old Scion. If he had a decent numbers, he just straight up pressed E on you, and then you died. There was nothing you could do. So then the question becomes, would it have been so bad for these champions to just stay bad? Forever. Always held back by weak numbers, just remaining niche picks for fun with the occasional one trick player in ranked? I honestly don't think so. They weren't hurting pro play. People weren't exactly cheesing AP Scion in LCS. Riot can keep all the ugly champs off the advertisements if they want, but I really like that there are low pick rate champions with dedicated communities. More importantly, Riot wants League to be a generational game, an esport that lasts decades. And I want that too, but a huge part of something lasting a long time is community and nostalgia. New content is important, sure, but Riot's got that covered. I think their new champs department is doing great. The reworks, however, are steadily erasing this game's history. I think a perfect example of this is what happened to RuneScape. RuneScape's main game has been on a steady decline for years, as its development focused on replacing and improving old content that players already loved, alienating them from the game. Eventually they released old school servers, based on a version of the game from its heyday. Most people thought the old school servers would be a short term nostalgia trip and that players would burn out pretty quickly. But here we are, five years later, and Old School RuneScape is in the top five most popular MMOs, its player base is triple that of modern RuneScape, and it's actively being developed with new content in its retro style. So why? What makes OSRS so enduring and fun to play? I think it's the development philosophy. Like I said before, the original path that RuneScape took in updates focused on improving the existing game, but that unintentionally killed what people loved about it. So now, OSRS is focused on adding content, expanding on the old mechanics and embracing the style of the game rather than replacing it. With that all being said, I may not personally see reworks as necessary, but I won't pretend they've all been bad or that there's no place for them. So let's take a look at what I think were Riot's most and least successful reworks, as well as talk about their general rework philosophy. Let's start off with the best reworks so we can see what works. Warwick, Zinn, and Cho. Now immediately you might point out Zinn and Cho'Gath never got full reworks, and you'd be right, but somehow with only minor changes and updates to their abilities, they managed to go from 
bottom of the barrel trash to totally viable solid champs with each even having a patch or two where they were overpowered. To me, that is fantastic and shows there is a path for champs to be modernized without being completely lost in the process. From his release on June 26, 2009 until February 23, 2017, which is the start of the changes that made him what he is now, he almost exclusively received buffs. That's right, Cho'Gath received buffs for 8 straight years and was still a dumpster fire, but 2 simple reworks to his abilities and he became totally viable. So what were those changes? Well first off, feast stacks were originally capped at 6. They were changed to then scale infinitely, and on top of that, you used to lose half your stacks on death. That was just straight up removed. Next, they added a bonus health ratio, meaning each stack caused the next to do more damage. In compensation, Feast lost some of its AP ratio, which was good because it nerfed the AP cheese one shot, and each stack gave a little bit less health. Overall, this was a massive buff to tank Cho, especially towards his late game. Still, that wasn't quite enough to make Cho viable, and he needed one more change and it came just 5 months later. Cho's E, Vorpal Spikes, causes his auto attack to shoot out a spike that damages all enemies in front of him. This was changed from a toggle on hit effect to a regular cooldown based ability that instead of being permanent, only empowered the next 3 autos. In addition, the spikes now slowed and reset Cho's auto. This change was absolutely massive for Cho'Gath. Giving him a slow was exactly what he needed to combo his abilities better. Auto attack resets are a massive early game power boost for trading and farming. This in combination with his feast buff took Cho from trash tier to a very strong tank with amazing late game scaling. Since then, number tuning to his basic abilities has even made AP Cho much healthier than it used to be. Now let's look at Zin. He was completely overtuned at launch, but after that was sorted out, he was generally considered unplayable at high MMR. Zin was a completely one-dimensional champion. All he could ever hope to do was E in and take down his target before he died. And like I mentioned earlier, this is that unhealthy gameplay. If his numbers were too high, this linear playstyle of I dash to you and one of us dies becomes super oppressive. The most interesting ability on his kit was his ultimate but its interesting use was simply a much worse and in many ways harder to pull off insect. So what changed? Much like Cho'Gath, two abilities were updated without losing his core functionality and identity. Riot maintained Zin's identity as an aggressive diver, but looked at his two main problems. He had no options besides diving in, and he had no way to survive after he did. To fix this, first they updated his W, which was simply an attack speed buff. This was changed to be a ranged poke ability that slows. This gave Zin much needed options. He no longer just has to dive in, he has much more ability to stay at range and wait for the right opportunity, and when he does dive in, he has some ability to chase if they flash away. Next, his ultimate was given a new effect, making Zin immune to damage from enemies outside of its range. This much needed defensive option makes Zin so much more reliable, and in turn, easier to balance number wise, because he's not just going to kill you or die when he dives in. These two champions for me are the absolute gold standard of updates in League of Legends. Two champions who were completely forgotten, unplayable at high MMR, but not weird enough to really have a cult following like Mord or Urgod. Yet with three updates to existing abilities and one new ability, they became viable and even sometimes top tier picks. Think about that. Cho never even got a new ability. That is how you modernize a champion without losing it. All on his own, no options to get out of anywhere, but Baker is going to fall down immediately. Pawn now looking for the DPS. Oh. As finally SKT get themselves back into the fight. Score in trouble as the Ren get, gets pulled out. For a full update, let's look at Warwick. He to me is the best of all the full graphical updates. Visually, look at this comparison. It's still clearly Warwick, just just nicer, and that's something that carries over to his abilities. They're all the same, but nicer. Nothing was lost in the update. His passive was on hit damage and healing, still on hit damage and healing. His Q was targeted damage and healing, still targeted damage and healing, but now he has the option to gap close. His W was an attack speed buff and his E was movement speed towards low health targets. Those got combined into the W ability so that his E could be given a more interactive ability. His R was a gap close suppression and damage. And it's still a gap close that suppresses and does damage. I think it's pretty clear just going over the abilities why this update works so well. Nothing about old Warwick feels lost. 
His passive Q and R all basically do exactly what they did before, but now in addition they give him options. The new Q follow mechanic is something only Warwick and Thresh have, helping him stand out. The R being a skill shot rather than a point and click allows Warwick to use it on targets without vision, as well as an escape. Plus, Riot can give it more power if it's able to be dodged. His W was super uninteractive. Moving into a passive on Bloodscent makes perfect sense, and his E is a cool new ability that no one else has, and it really goes with his theme. There's not too much to say about Warwick, really. 10 out of 10. This, like Cho and Zin, feels like an update, not a new champion. Speaking of new champions, let's look at the worst reworks. Starting with Riven 2, Aatrox Boogaloo. Oh boy. <laughs> now let's get this out of the way. I don't think new Aatrox is a bad champion. In fact, I love him, and think he's way better than old Aatrox. But he should not have been Aatrox's rework. He should have just been a new champ. He could still even be a Darken and have all the same abilities and basically look the same. Just swap out his sword for hammer and call him, like, I don't know, Howard with two A's, of course. Blam, there you go, new Darken champ, everybody's happy. Put old Aatrox back in the game and take another crack at his rework in a few months. Of course, that would never happen, so let's start with the visuals. Looking at these side-by-side -side comparisons, I think... It's a side grade, rather than an upgrade or downgrade. Both versions have their own style, but I don't think either is flat out better than the other. I do however think their silhouettes have a very different effect, which is a problem if they're meant to be the same character. Old Aatrox's wing design was genius, one of the best pieces of visual storytelling in League. In his old lore he was meant to be effectively a god of war, hiding in the shadows, inciting people to battle, so having his silhouette and wings mirror that of a war banner was phenomenal. The thematic visual tie for me was the absolute best thing about old Aatrox, and it's just a really cool design. Between old and new Aatrox, the Darkens lore was changed to them being trapped in their weapons, and new Aatrox's silhouette reflects that by focusing much more on centering the sword, which is cool in its own way, but not as deep for me as the old version. And that's where we run into our first problem with Riot's design philosophy of fulfilling a fantasy. That idea works fantastically when designing new champs, starting from what would it be like to play as X, designing abilities around that, making sure the gameplay matches their theme, can lead to really interesting champs. But what happens if the fantasy is arbitrarily changed between release and update? And even if that doesn't happen, why doesn't this method work with reworks? Fundamentally, I think it's because as much as lots of players care about theme and lore, when it comes down to it, that's not the way that we pick champions. Players pick champions based on playstyle above all else. Nobody goes into champ select and thinks, I feel like living out the fantasy of a pirate lord, and then picks Gangplank on a whim. They either like Gangplank's barrel mechanic and play him, or they don't. Aatrox was an auto attack focused bruiser, and the people who played him and loved him didn't pick him for his lore or his theme. They picked him because he was an auto attack focused bruiser, and that's what they play. They usually also play Jax and Aurelia and Trindamir, just like there are players who play Zed, Talon, LeBlanc, and Fizz. Once a champion is out and has players and a fan base, the gameplay becomes the most important part of their identity, and it's what Riot should be looking to preserve in an update. Now I do think they are more conscious of this now, after the reception of the Aatrox rework, than they were when they started all of this. Think about Scion and Taric. So I doubt we'll see another one as drastic as Aatrox, which is good. Honestly, there's not much more to say about Aatrox. I don't consider him a failed rework because his new gameplay is bad. Almost the opposite. He failed as a rework because he wasn't an update of the gameplay people already enjoyed. He was a completely new champion. Riot's focus on higher artistic direction above what people cared about, which was the gameplay, is the issue. Beyond that, the two versions are so radically different, there's no point comparing individual abilities. He went from an auto attack focused split pusher to an ability based team fighter. The things that they preserved were the fact that he heals and can revive, but those aren't part of his core gameplay pattern, they're pretty superficial to his overall kit. So what would I have done? I think for the most part, he was in the same situation as Zin pre-rework. All he could do was go in and either you killed him or he killed you. So the main thing he needs is a defensive tool. Irelia has her damage reduction, Trind has his AD reduction, Jax has Counter-Strike. Aatrox didn't really have a good defensive option that fighters need. So first off I would leave his Q and E as they were. I think Bloodthirst and Price was his most unique 
concept, so I'd make it the focus of his kit, and move it to his R, but make it available at level 1 like a form swap, think Nid or Jace, and instead of every third hit causing the effect, all attacks and abilities would have the effect. So when it's on, all abilities and attacks deal more damage at the cost of health, or when it's off, all abilities and attacks heal for some amount of their damage. This leaves W open for a new defensive ability. Now, a brief aside, I have a video planned to talk about something very specific with Akali and Irelia reworks, but I did want to mention something about them in this video as well. Voiboy doesn't play Akali anymore, and GBA99 seemingly quit League after the Irelia rework. Voiboy was THE Akali player. It was his signature champ, he was the only pro who was even willing to play her, but as far as I know, he basically doesn't play her at all anymore. He has only a handful of games on her this season. And Jibei was League of Legends' biggest fan and most upbeat content creator. He played a thousand ranked games of Aurelia in Season 7, whereas in Season 8 when a rework came out, only 150, and by two months after her release, he seemingly quit playing entirely to focus on documentaries and esports coverage. Now that doesn't mean their reworks were the reason, but I do think it's interesting to point out. And kinda sad. Okay, since this video is becoming way too long, I'm just gonna talk about one more champion. And for me, this is the one that really hit home, and largely inspired this video. Nunu. I absolutely loved the old Nunu. He was honestly one of my favorite champions. He had viable serious and off-meta playstyles, he had his own unique strategies, he was a huge part of League memes and jokes, videos and culture. He still managed to pop up in competitive now and again, he had a massive impact on League as a whole. With that being said, I'm not blind. His design was terrible, and he's ugly, and his gameplay may have had strategic depth, but it was mechanically one-dimensional. For me though, what his rework comes down to is when I look at Nunu now, I don't feel anything. I can see how wonderful and just pure magic the new design is. It's honestly brilliant, but I have six years worth of memories of old Nunu. Some of my best times playing League ever were with the old Nunu, throwing a 1000 AP snowball and one-shotting someone casually walking past the enemy jungler trying to sneak drag and stealing it just to keep on walking by, getting the full empire off in a bush, or even having a teammate disco Nunu me in ranked. And it's just gone, and I don't know how to feel about that. This Nunu's design and gameplay is better, and compared to the Aatrox rework we looked at, it follows much more of his original gameplay, so it's better as a rework in that way too. But I think this is where I come back to the start of this video. That bad champions have their own value. Is having Nunu look and play a little bit better worth more than invalidating a decade's worth of memes and videos, gutting a huge piece of the community's nostalgia? I don't think so. I think there's genuine value in having champions that are bad. They contrast with how high quality things have gotten, and it was great having champions that were funny. Everything in League's design has gotten so serious. Even the lighthearted champions are so well crafted. It was nice having something to laugh at once in a while. Tarek's pizza feet are gone. Scion doesn't make terrible movie references. Urgot doesn't even have nipples anymore. Multiplayer games survive on the strength of their community. The people that will evangelize the game to everyone they can. And I worry this pushes those people away from League. I'm going to end with a quick little story that got me thinking more about this. When I first saw the room, it blew my mind. It was so incredible, terrible, and funny. I, when I showed it to my friends, they loved it too, and then we watched for it to come to our local theater, and we went and threw the spoons with everyone else, and it was a blast. And we'll probably go back and do it the next time it comes to our theater. And I had a similar experience with League. I have a friend who mainly plays Dota 2, but I convinced him to give League a try. And after a few bot games he was getting the hang of it, I decided to jump onto a smurf and play a game with him. Old Nunu was free that week, and he had been playing him with the recommended tank support items. So I decided to show him what Nunu was really capable of. So I went Nunu top, full AP, Luden's death cap, while he went bot as another tank support champion. I got myself fed and farmed and took the top tower, and then looked to roam bot and help him out. I walked into lane, snowballed the enemy Sona, and full on one shot her. It was absolutely hilarious for him. And from that point on in the game, we just strolled around as a duo, snowballing everything. 
My friend was so incredibly surprised seeing this. Coming from Dota where at the time abilities didn't scale in any way, and having him tried Nunu beforehand with the recommended support tank items, he thought he knew what damage Nunu could do, and it was honestly one of the most fun games I've played in my years and years of playing. Now I could have played LeBlanc and done the same thing, but it wouldn't have had the same impact. That's what LeBlanc is supposed to do. She looks cool doing it, she has flashy particle effects. There's something special about seeing ugly, dumb old Nunu waddle into a lane, throw goofy, slow-moving snowball that's unavoidable, and have it do someone's entire health bar. In the end, I think that's the main point. There's a way to update champions without killing them, and Riot's done a good job of that in a few places. But in other cases, I think that might not even be necessary, because bad champions have their own value. And it's been sad to see basically all of them at this point go. They were a huge part of this game's history, and I hope Riot considers that going forward. Anyway, if you're still watching and you made it through this insane ramble, thank you so much. I know the end got a lot less analytical, but I really can't say anything negative about the new new rework besides it feels wrong. As you may have noticed, this is my first video, but definitely the first of many, so please subscribe and leave a like, and leave a comment with your opinion on the reworks. What were your favorites, least favorites, and lastly, if you're interested in my future content, um, there will be more leak content, such as where I think Riot should take items, and the Akali and Aurelia video I mentioned, as well as videos on other games, such as what new mechanics in Civ 6 worked or didn't, a comparison of Elder Scrolls 3, 4, and 5, and a playthrough of an old school RuneScape account with some pretty special restrictions. Once again, thanks for watching, see you next time.